It's so nice to be with you uh, here today, and I hope everyone is having a, a wonderful day. And I, I want to share from the very onset uh, two things. I want to share, first of all, that I agree wholeheartedly with uh, our esteemed uh, chair, uh, Peter uh, La Barbera, uh, who shared that I think it's very important for us to take the offensive rather than be on the defensive. That is absolutely essential. And the second uh, area of agreement uh, I would like to uh, share with him is that we, we must not uh, assume that certain uh, areas and certain debates in which we are now engaged are lost because in a, a very real sense, the numbers are on our side. And that's largely uh, what I do. Uh, what I do is uh, a lot of quantitative analysis to uh, indicate that uh, what we know to be true uh, really is true. So what I'm going to share with you today is uh, the results of uh, four uh, meta-analyses, uh, most of which are either have been published or in the process of publication, because I think it's very important for people who are pro-family and uh, pro-faith to, to understand. And it, it's also important uh, as we communicate with the secular community to understand that many in the secular community, not all certainly, as our previous speakers have highlighted, but many people do in fact open their minds if in fact you can show them the numbers. <coughs> Most of us are familiar with the uh, verse out of the book of John that says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And even though that is first and foremost a spiritual truth, it is also true that many times when you do quantitative analysis, it indicates what we, also, what we already know to be spiritually true. So um, I'm going to share with you uh, four meta-analyses that I have done, and I'll explain to you in just a moment what a meta-analysis is, because I'm not going to assume that everyone here knows what a meta-analysis is. But the four meta-analyses I'm going to share with you very briefly are, number one, a meta-analysis comparing faith-based schools versus public schools and public charter schools. Secondly, a meta-analysis on factors that reduce the achievement gap, both the racial achievement gap and the socioeconomic achievement gap. Third, a meta-analysis on the effects of Bible literacy on students. And finally, a meta-analysis on the effects of family structure and parental involvement on uh, student achievement. And again, I think it's very important for uh, us as people who are pro-faith and, and pro-family to be aware uh, of, of these numbers. Now, what is a meta-analysis and why is uh, a meta-analysis so important? Well, a meta-analysis statistically combines all the relevant existing studies on a given subject in order to determine the aggregated results of said research. What does that mean? Well, in essence, what a meta-analysis does is it takes all, and it takes a lot of time. This is why there are very few meta-analyses that have been done. But what a meta-analysis does is it takes all the studies that have been done on a particular topic, it combines them statistically and quantitatively so that the results indicate what does the overall body of research indicate. So, for example, let's just say that there have been 90 studies done on a particular area, such as schooling that I'm about to mention, comparing public and faith-based schools. Who has the time to read through 90 individual studies? And many of the findings will contradict one another. What a meta-analysis does is it takes all of the 90 studies, combines them, and then says, OK, the overall finding, if you combine all 90 studies together, this is what the overall finding indicates. And the beauty of it all is many people who are government leaders love meta-analyses because they don't have the time to read the individual study, uh, individual studies, and they want to know what does the overall body of research say. So even though it often takes two or three years to do a meta-analysis, once a meta-analysis is published, they tend to be highly read and highly cited by academics and by government leaders. So uh, first, uh, I want to talk about a meta-analysis comparing faith-based schools versus public schools and public charter schools. Public charter schools are unique especially to the United States. Now, I'm not going to go through all the methods for all the metas. I'm just going to give you one example. This particular one, I looked at 60 different research databases, basically every major one that is out there. There were 90 studies. and. It tells you what I coded and so on and so forth, and it also indicates 
Number five, that the studies were also rated by the quality of the study, which is also uh, very, uh, very important. And uh, what, what emerges is that uh, you see, and I'll kind of depart from the microphone a little bit here, uh, the positive, uh, these are uh, essentially effect sizes. The positive effect sizes indicate favoring a uh, positive effect for faith-based schools. And 0.26 would, translated, would translate into about uh, 0.3 of a grade point, okay, or a little bit more than, or about a third of a, of a, uh, of a grade point. And uh, what we see is combining U.S. and foreign schools that uh, the advantage goes to faith-based schools, that children who are in faith-based schools do much better than their counterparts in public schools. And not only that, but we see on the right, the, this uh, left-hand column deals with faith-based faith schools. The right-hand column examines charter schools, charter public schools. And we see in the case of charter public schools, they don't do any better than children who are in traditional public schools. Now this is very important because in the United States and in other places today, many people are looking to alternatives to traditional public schools and uh, maybe not faith-based schools, but other alternatives. And some people are saying, well, we can't, it seems like there isn't that much room for school choice in many countries. I know many countries in Europe do have uh, school choice at different levels, tax breaks and so forth for those who send their children to faith-based schools, but uh, in the United States we usually do not. And, uh, but we see that really, if we really want students to excel, the data supports faith-based schools. And this is very important for people to know, the children just do better. And so when you show go government officials and academics the data that indicate this, they're much more likely to be convinced. And again, once again, we need to realize that uh, the data is on our side. And this is basically the same type results except using those studies rated high in quality. The results are even stronger. So that is meta-analysis number one. Meta-analysis number two on the uh, factors, and by the way, meta-analysis number one will be published uh, July 20th in the Peabody Journal of Education if you want to read more about it. Meta-analysis number two on the factors that reduce the achievement gap. And what we find is that the factors, uh, many governments have been trying to reduce the racial achievement gap, the socioeconomic achievement gap for some time, and guess what? Reduces the achievement gap. What two factors reduce the achievement gap more than the other? Religious faith <laughs> and family factors. And in fact, now here's the surprise, hold on to your chairs if your heart is weak, okay? <laughs> Other analyses that I have done indicate that if you have a, a, a African American or black children uh, or a Latino children who are children of faith, if they are children of faith and they come from a two-parent biological family, you have those, those two factors, guess what? The achievement gap, it disappears. It's gone. It is gone. Now here are all our government leaders saying we need to do this, we need more money, we need to do that, we need to do this. The answer has been staring them in the face all these years. It is faith and family. Down deep we know that. We need to present the numbers to our leaders so that they can understand that same truth as well. Meta-analysis number three on the effects of vital literacy on students. You would be amazed the extent, this is one of the areas I'm very involved with, ever since the Bible and prayer were removed out of the public schools in the United States in 62, 1962 and 1963, the United States has been going down uh, by almost any measure, crime, academic achievement, uh, and so forth. Uh, I'm heavily involved in uh, trying to get the Bible as literature, which is permissible constitutionally, back into the public schools, and guess what? When I present the data before legislators and so forth that I'm about to present, minds are open. Because what it turns out is that there is a strong relationship, and by the way, these numbers uh, are almost equal to a full grade point. 
In other words, someone who is a student who is familiar with the Bible probably averages their averages about an A minus in school or a B plus. Someone who's not familiar with the Bible, their average tends to be about a B minus or C plus. Now you tell me which would you prefer your children to come back with on their report cards, okay? So what we find is that children who have a knowledge of the Bible do far better in school than those who do not, even apart from their faith, if they have a knowledge. And a lot of that is because so much of, so many of the authors that have written over the years, whether it be Charles Dickens, Duff Stoyevsky, I mean, you can go right on down the line, they assume that the reader has a familiarity with the Bible. William Shakespeare alone cites the Bible 1,300 times. Much of history is best understood if children know the Bible, and so there is a very strong relationship between Bible literacy and doing well in school. And guess what? When people are shown this, they open up their minds, even to the extent that I was uh, asked by uh, the Chinese government, yes, the Chinese government, to come to China and share at Peking University uh, because uh, they are interested in including the Bible as literacy, literacy in their public schools because they understand there is a relationship between Bible literacy and academic achievement. They also believe many, and I realize there's a battle there between many communists and people who are open to Christianity, but there is an understanding among many of China's leaders. They have huge immorality problems, and they believe, many of them believe, the only hope that they may have to solve their problems on immorality may indeed be the Bible. And one of the interesting things about China, in the reverse of the West, the people who are most open to the Bible are the elite, are the leadership, the doctors, the lawyers, the physicians. Uh, this is pretty amazing. And once again, it really comes down to the numbers back pro-family and pro-faith. And finally, the last meta-analysis is on the effects of family structure and parental involvement on children's academic achievement. Uh, I will just present this. Whoops, I guess the number didn't print uh, appropriately there. But uh, in essence, what this shows, this is the effects of parental divorce on measures of academic achievement. Uh, but it's true for all <coughs> measures uh, of family structure that in essence, what this indicates, and this works out to about a third of the grade point, downward, that the farther you get away from a two-parent biological family, the more of a negative impact it tends to have on children, both academically and behaviorally. And if we are to have any hope of prevailing in this debate regarding homosexuality and other non-traditional family structures, it's very important that when dealing with academics and with dealing with government officials, we show them the numbers that these alternative family structures are not good for our children, and as societies around the world, every nation, we need to be concerned. And this is uh, similar effects for parental involvement. Once again, the more parents are involved with their children's education, the better it is for children. So today, I am an optimist. I know we can read it in the newspapers, and sometimes as people who are family-oriented people and faith-oriented people, it is easy to get discouraged. Sometimes we're all excited when we wake up in the morning and then we pick up the paper and we go, oh no, oh, how f what fools these mortals be, to uh, quote uh, that, that old adage. But uh, I am an optimist because the numbers back us. And largely what I do is I publish in secular journals and in secular books because these are the people that need to be convinced. And you know what? The numbers back what we believe, and so we can leave out of here being encouraged. Thank you very much. <laughs>